Welcome to the second season of the Florida Institute for Child Welfare podcast. I am Jessica Price, your host. In this season, we are focused on reimagining child welfare through technology and innovation. We will hear from visionary leaders on how they are working intentionally and collaboratively to enhance and innovate child welfare. Today on the Florida Institute for Child Welfare podcast, we're talking with Dr. Karen Randolph, a professor in the College of Social Work at FSU. We will learn about information and communication technology and its utility in case management and child welfare services. Let's get started. Dr. Randolph, thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you. So I usually start by asking what brought you into child welfare. We'd love to hear kind of your journey in. Sure. Well, I started working in child welfare in the late 70s after I graduated with my MSW. Started as a a director of a group home for uh, adolescents and worked in a residential treatment center type setting for six years and then went to, I guess, what would be child welfare proper. Worked at Montgomery County Children's Services in Dayton, Ohio, both kids who were in uh, placement and then kids who were in their own homes and we were trying to maintain the families. So I was, it was a total of 15 years. And after you got done with that tenure, what got you involved in kind of the academic side? Yeah, well, I to be honest, I got burned out. It's a tough job. And uh, back then, we were dealing with the impact of crack cocaine and it did some strong deliberation about what my next journey was would look like and so decided to go back to school and get my PhD and it involved really getting rid of everything you know I sold everything and (laughs) bought a pickup truck drove down to North Carolina so it was quite an adventure that sounds about right (laughs) in my 40s so well I'm glad you're in the academic world now because we get to learn about one of your latest projects and um, I'd love for you to tell the listeners about ICT what that stands for and just take us through that sure well ICT is information and communication technology. And basically what we mean by that is all the electronic tools that are available for communication, email, text messaging, social media, video conferencing, that sort of thing. Tools that we can use in a virtual world to communicate with one another. Wow. So that definitely seems relevant in the world we're living in now with this global pandemic, but you started this before the pandemic. So what brought this into your interest? Yeah, sure. I'm a a, a digital immigrant, which (laughs) means that I was born long before uh, we had uh, computers and electronic tools and so on. And I've encountered my own struggles with learning how to become technologically competent. And I think through that started to also wonder about the impact of of electronic communication on relationships. There is a lot of talk and a lot of research, a lot of commentary on the difficulty in developing and maintaining relationships in an online world. So that really was the starting point for me to examine this. Interesting. Thank you for explaining how you got interested in this topic, but I'd love to also hear about the challenges of the social work client relationship with this ICT. Sure. So we did uh, quite a bit of investigation looking at what has been written and what has been investigated with regard to the challenges and identified at least four different challenges. One of the major challenges, of course, is the worker client boundaries. You know, we know those boundaries to be pretty traditional in terms of you know, nine to five and maybe some after hours. But in a virtual world, basically boundaries are much more permeable. What what can lead to what we call professional uh, boundary gray zones. So in other words, boundaries can be really difficult with clients. They can be difficult to identify yet easy to cross. At what point, you know, do we declare that we're no longer available? This is so true. And as a previous child welfare worker, I really tried to pride myself on having boundaries and having work-life balance, but you're right. When people start to text you and when they now have your phone number, it might look a little different. Sure. And, and how do you navigate those issues with the client that you invested in creating a, a positive relationship with? Right, so, right. Uh, another challenge is uh, developing and maintaining what's called both technical competence and digital literacy. So we can learn how to use tools, have competence in that area. But we also need to have uh, literacy in terms of thinking 
critically about how to use tools, when to use them, which tool is better to use than another, that sort of thing. So uh, another challenge is dealing with the increased surveillance capacities that social media provides to us and how that might impact the social worker client relationship. Social worker as caregiver, social worker as partner in the treatment process, and social worker as the control agent. So these can create some tensions. And then finally, sometimes there can be message misunderstanding, sending messages through, uh, especially asynchronously through email and text messaging. People can think that you said one thing or or indicated one thing and really you meant something completely different. Wow, that's so true especially about the social media. So when I was a child protective investigator, we definitely tried to find things out about our clients on social media. We were trying to complete our investigations and some of them were non-responsive. So we tried to be creative with how do we find them or where are they and why aren't they responsive? So it's interesting ways to leverage social media, but you're right to think through around that surveillance is also kind of a touchy area. Well, it raises issues around, uh, some ethical issues around transparency and disclosure in using social media for those purposes. So it's a, it's a complicated policy issue that I think really goes beyond the individual worker and really is an agency level issue. Right. So I know we just went over the challenges of using ICT in a social worker client relationship, but what are some of the benefits of using ICT? Sure. And we've identified five benefits. First, the availability of these ICT tools just allows for more ways to communicate with the client. So the tool belt, if you will, has expanded. And there's beyond just phone and face-to-face, there's all kinds of other ways that we can communicate with our clients. Also, through the availability of more tools, a second benefit is just having increased social presence in an online world, just sort of a more sense of connectedness, being more available, being more present in the client's world through um, ICT opportunities. Another benefit is having fixed records of communication, such as through email and text messaging. So this is not only good for documentation purposes, but it also gives both the client client and the worker an opportunity to reflect on what's been exchanged and and not having to rely necessarily on, you know, memory, but rather to be able to look at the words and think about it and ponder what next steps might be coming and so forth. Many workers have identified the ease and efficiency of ICT. For example, it's much more time efficient and easy to use your mobile phone to send a text message or an email or to make a call while you're outside of the office as opposed to some more traditional methods. And the final benefit is related to client preferences. You know, we've all been trained in the idea that we start where the client is at. And many clients these days, especially our younger clients, prefer to communicate using ICT. So this is more compatible and more responsive to what their preferences are. Absolutely. I know I had clients that only wanted to text me. (laughs) So I would call them and they wouldn't pick up and almost immediately I would get a text from them. So you're absolutely right. So as you know, one of my main focuses lately has been that power differential between child welfare professionals and their clients. I deconstruct power theory to really think about how we wield power, how we negotiate it, and if we share it with families. So curious about the connection between the power differentials and ICT. Sure. And there's at least two ways that we can think about that, the type of impact. On the positive side, having ICT use available in worker-client interactions can serve to redistribute power. It gives the clients an opportunity to reach out to the workers with more mechanisms, you know, to initiate contact and to stay connected with their workers more than like telephone and in-person visits. On the other hand, we talked about the issue of surveillance and questions about the ethics and the power imbalance, especially if we're using social media for surveillance purposes without the client's knowledge. And so this raises some issues with the power imbalance as well. 
So what factors should be considered when selecting what ICT to use with your clients? We've identified five factors that we think are important to consider when deciding which ICT would be best to use. The first factor is the bandwidth, the amount of Q systems uh, that the uh, communication medium supports. So like with email, well, email is just basically text. It's written word and image. As opposed to video conferencing, you've got both your verbal and your nonverbal uh, cue systems that become available in the communication exchange. So that's definitely one thing you want to keep in mind. What's been shown in the research is that the greater the bandwidth, the stronger the emotional closeness there is between the two parties. So for for instance, at the start of the relationship, the worker may want to use video conferencing because it provides more knowledge or more, more information about the exchange for both the worker and the client. So my understanding, you when you say at the start of the relationships, so at the beginning of a case, yes, maybe do virtual meetings. Yeah, if okay. yes, if you can't do home visits, um, a virtual meeting would would allow for more information, more of a, a depth of interaction than say email, um, or even phone. So that would be secondary to the primary of meeting them in person. Exactly. Is what you're yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and these we can think of these these uh, tools as uh, just in addition to uh, face-to-face and and telephone. So it it basically, it's an expansion of what's available. Another factor to consider is the opportunity for mutual, mutual, what's called mutual directionality. And this is the opportunity for synchronous, synchronous exchange, that immediate exchange back and forth that is provided, like, in person or in a uh, video conferencing system and that sort of thing. Sometimes those synchronous exchanges are really important. Other times they're really not necessary. If the intent is to uh, communicate, hey, you've got an appointment on this date and time, that probably doesn't call for, you know, an in-person or or a synchronous exchange. A third factor is the extent to which the message is sensitive and private. And if the message is uh, sensitive and private, then it would behoove a uh, worker to use something that they can maintain that that restriction, that confidentiality. So of course, don't want to use social media if the information is sensitive. Another factor to consider is the extent to which the content is formal. If the message is a formal type exchange, then something to think about is maybe use email, something that can be documented. And the final factor to consider is the complexity of the message content. If the message content is complex, that's going to cause or or that can lead to a, a difficulty in that exchange. So messages that are complex may be better served to be done through uh, something with greater bandwidth, like video conferencing. So if you've got a, a complicated thing to share where, you know, an exchange is use, uh, and a synchronous exchange is useful and that body language is important and the feedback is important, video conferencing would probably be best served in that situation. No, that makes total sense. I think when I was thinking about email, I was thinking if it's a lot of information and sometimes I'm so visual, so I was thinking maybe it should be emailed, but I hear what you're saying. It's, you might get some feedback. If it's going to be a dynamic conversation that's needed, it should be done not in an email. So that makes sense. So I know we talked about power theory a little bit a few moments ago, and I wanted to also ask about communication theory and how that connects to this. Sure. Much of our work in this area has revolved around looking at communication theory. And of course, theory is a really important uh, tool to use in helping us put parameters around our thinking, helping us make decisions about how we're going to approach our client systems and that kind of stuff. So it's really critical. Specifically in this case, we found three 
uh, communication theories that were really useful in helping us make sense of communicating with clients that worker-client relationship. The first one is social information processing theory, and this basically is a theory that has been shown to support that, yes, in fact, we can develop interpersonal close relationships in an online environment. It just takes longer. We don't have as much information as we have when we're developing relationships in an in-person setting. So we have to accommodate for that and and give ourselves a little bit more time than we would normally in an in-person situation. Another theory that was very important to our work is uh, social presence theory. And this goes back to uh, what we talked about in terms of one of the benefits, that connectedness, that sense of connection that certainly can happen in an online environment. We can feel socially connected in an online world, similar to what we might feel in a a face-to-face type situation. And then the third theory that we used or that we found to be useful is electronic propinquity theory. And, and this is the idea of a psychological closeness between hmm. the sender and the receiver in an online environment. And that theory, which has been tested many times, shows that, yes, we can have this psychological closeness in an online environment. Hmm. So, No, that's really interesting. And it's just making me think about what I mentioned earlier about utilizing social media to try to get a hold of clients or to try to reach out to them because I'm, I'm hearing these theories and how there's this, for lack of better words, social intimacy you can have online. And when I'm thinking about me as an investigator reaching into someone's social media world, mm, mm-hmm. you know, it, some people feel like it's a free for all at social media, just send them a message. But just hearing those theories, it's like that could be their their space. Mm-hmm. And why am I inserting myself into their social network? So it's interesting. I think it's important, like you said earlier, that there are some parameters, some conversations organizationally. How far are we going to take this investigation? Like, how are we going to get a hold of clients if we can't reach them? So. And there's a lot we don't know yet about yeah. all this. I mean, this is a really new area in terms mm-hmm. of, um, you know, developing uh, our practice approaches in an online world. So, And that lends itself to a conversation around implications. Yeah. You know, whether we have implications for practice, policy, research. What are your thoughts around implications? Sure. Well, there's, there are certainly implications for practice, education, and research in this area. The two practice implications we've already discussed, that was the use of social media for client surveillance and what the impact is on the worker-client relationship, specifically in terms of worker as partner in the change process and a worker as, you know, a control agent. We also talked about the possibility of being able to redistribute the power a little bit, having the clients more more able to reach out to their workers in terms of what they need and when they need it and things like that. The third practice implication involves the social presence that provides opportunities to reconceptualize and even maybe expand our worker-client boundaries. Uh, You know, we're living in an online world now. Uh, It's the digital age. It may be time to re-examine what our views are, what our professional stance is around boundaries. And then the final um, practice implication, this is a social justice issue. This is around needing to account for the digital divide. So So client access to tools, electronic tools, as well as a reliable internet connection, especially for clients who are living in rural areas where the broadband isn't as strong. Uh, In terms of education, educational implications, I think we really have to look at what we're doing in our social work programs with regard to educating our students around not only becoming technologically competent, but also digitally literate not only with our students, but our current practitioners to offer perhaps, you know, uh, webinars, other training opportunities where they can develop and maintain these skills and also think critically about how to use them and when. And then finally, with regard to research, we think it's really important to uh, have work in this area to be theoretically driven. Uh, We found communication theories, the three communication theories that I mentioned, to be quite promising. There's likely other theories that will be helpful in pushing this work forward. 
Also, we think it's really important to investigate the impact of ICT on worker well-being as well as client well-being. You and I both know that that there's really a, a crisis in worker retention, worker turnover. Can the availability of these electronic tools reduce some of the burden, uh, some of the frustration and stress that these workers feel to make a more pleasing work environment, a more satisfying work environment? Hmm. The final uh, implication with regard to research in terms of the future is, you know, we really need to untangle the impacts of these tool features. In other words, bandwidth, the mutual directionality, the information complexity, and so so on, to increase our evidence with regard to tool selection. So we have some preliminary evidence supported by theory with regard to these tool features, but it's time to get this stuff out in the field and really understand what's going on. I'm so intrigued about the use of ICT and also professional boundaries and work-life balance because of what you just said. The well-being of workers has always been in this volatile way and not being sustained in our in our workforce. And if we start to really lean on ICT, I just wonder how that might impact workload and but it's really an individual decision of how to set boundaries but I wonder can we do more organizationally kind of educate on boundaries right I think uh, organizational level education would be great and it needs to be uh, really a policy decision where where we have input from all levels of a practice and can really flush out what the issues are and the pros and cons and so forth in a way that we can develop best practices in this area So I'm also curious, Dr. Randolph, about when you were in the field, you called yourself a digital immigrant. Is that what you called it? (laughs) So when you were doing casework, I'm assuming you didn't have all of these avenues of ICT. Did you feel like you had work-life balance? Did you feel like you had any issues with boundaries? Like, how was it different? Well, so I would never make any plans on Friday afternoon (laughs) because I I was in a position to handle children who were coming into care. And inevitably, we would have families of children coming into care, and I would have to just be available to make sure that they were moving through the system and getting their medical checkups, and we had placements for them and that sort of thing. And so, um, yeah, I think I struggled with, you know, boundaries. And so imagine struggling with boundaries without all of these, you know, ICT tools, yeah. <laughs> you know, and yeah. right now. So yeah. in this age, in this digital age, I wonder if boundaries will be, will be even harder. I think so, because it's a lot more complicated. Yeah. And I think there's the nuances to take into consideration. Mm-hmm. That's why it really has to be done in a thoughtful, methodical way. And in the part of this podcast that it's also really sticking with me is choosing which ICT for what time. Because I'm thinking about as child welfare professionals, if we choose the wrong one, I'm putting wrong in quotes, (laughs) you know, if we're trying to get some information from a client, like you said, they could send you an answer or send you things via text. And it's not really getting to the authenticity of who they are or what they're doing or behavioral change. So it's even more important to pick the right ICT because you might be getting a completely different picture of what someone is actually doing by a few words on a phone. Absolutely. And of course, that changes over time. As we develop relationships with one another, if you're sending me a text message now, I'm going to have a pretty good idea about what the intent is because we know one another, we have that background, but especially in the beginning of a relationship where there's a lot of unknowns, that can be a real risk. So Dr. Randolph, can you tell us what's next for ICT? Sure. Well, what we're hoping is that social workers, all social workers, think about ICT in terms of enhancing their practice, enhancing their abilities to make that relationship with that client rather than ICT as an impediment. Many of our digital natives, workers who have grown up with ICT, can easily, you know, see, uh, I think, embrace this view. Others of us who have not, who have uh, continued maybe to struggle with it. So we're really hoping that people can embrace the ICT as an enhancement rather than an impediment. 
Um, we also recommend that ICT should be incorporated into one's practice repertoire thoughtfully and really consider the potential implications in developing that relationship with the client, maintaining the respect and the rapport that's so important when we're working with our clients and so forth. Um, finally, we think it's really important for agency leaders to be proactive in embracing technology, embracing uh, these ICT in a way that can enhance the, the work life and ultimately client outcomes. So one thing I guess I'd like to say is, you know, as a profession, I think um, it's useful for us to reflect upon the fact that we've been here before. You know, similar struggles were encountered in the early 1900s with the invention of the telephone. Mm -hmm. Our pioneering social workers had the same kind of questions, dealt with the same kind of issues. We overcame that and we can certainly overcome this. Agreed. Thank you so much, Dr. Randolph. Is there anywhere folks that are listening in can get more information about this? Sure. I'm happy to respond to any questions or any uh, requests for information. If anybody wants to email me, that would be great. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Randolph, for being with us. I want to give a huge thanks to our guests, and we are so appreciative of their commitment to improving our child welfare system. If you want to learn more about this topic or contact these speakers, please visit www.ficw.fsu.edu. Stay safe and well. <laughs>